Billions of years ago, our whole solar system was nothing but a big cloud of dust and gas floating in space. Then, something happened to disturb that cloud, but scientists still aren't sure what exactly it was. It could have been a distant star that turned into a supernova with a bang that caused the dust cloud to start spinning. As it spun faster, the dust and gas got pulled into the center and created a thick, spinning disk called a solar nebula. The gravity at the center became so strong that hydrogen atoms started crashing into each other, producing helium and a lot of energy. As a result of all these space shenanigans, we got our Sun about 4.6 billion years ago. This process used up more than 99% of the dust and gas in the big cloud. The leftover stuff started to come together to make different shapes. The cloud kept spinning, and bits of matter bumped into each other and stuck together. Some of these clumps got big enough to have their own gravity, which pulled even more matter to them. This is how the planets, including our Earth, were made. You wouldn't recognize our planet, though, as it was nothing like we know and love it today. It was hot, and I'm not talking about perfect beach weather hot. It was scorching hot, as it was mostly made of magma, which is basically melted rock. Just imagine how hot it should be to make the stones melt. After a few hundred million years, Earth started to cool down. As the planet changed and its outer crust started to form, there were lots of volcanic eruptions. These volcanoes released water vapor, ammonia, and carbon dioxide into the air around the planet. Slowly, oceans started to form from the water vapor. The planet was every introvert's dream back then, with not a single living being around until the day when the first simple life forms began to appear and live in the new oceans. Those tiny organisms were single-celled microbes that gave birth to all future lives, including yours. They left signs and rocks that are about 3.7 billion years old. The signs were a type of carbon molecule made by living things. Then, at least 2.4 billion years ago, cyanobacteria evolved. These were the first organisms to make food using water and the sun's energy and they released oxygen. This caused a big increase in oxygen, which made it hard for other microbes that couldn't handle oxygen to survive. Then, tiny microbes started living inside other tiny microbes. This way, they were forming organelles, small structures inside a cell with a specific function. One important organelle is called mitochondria, and it helps turn food into energy. For the first time, DNA got packed inside a part of the cell called the nucleus. These new complex cells, called eukaryotic cells, had different parts that each did a special job to help the whole cell work better. Soon enough, the earliest animals would rule the world. But don't get your hopes up. They weren't fluffy kittens. All the changes on Earth were happening against the background of the supercontinent Rodinia which formed around 1.2 billion years ago. It pulled together almost all of Earth's land masses into one gigantic piece of land. It was surrounded by a massive ocean, so the whole planet looked like a giant land and sea puzzle. Unlike the green, lively continents we have now, Rodinia was barren and rocky, with no plants or animals on land. So, early life forms like algae thrived in the ocean. The breakup of Rodinia caused changes in Earth's climate and ocean currents. New coastlines and environments eventually helped diversify life on Earth. Cells began living together and finally evolved into the first animals around 800 million years ago. Sponges, and I don't mean the loofah you use to shower, were some of the earliest animals. By around 580 million years ago, they had neighbors, including fronds, ribbons, and quilts. But then, another 40 million years later, which is like a minute in evolutionary time, the conditions changed. 
oxygen levels rose and the first animals were replaced by new life forms. It was the beginning of the Cambrian period, the time of the giant shrimps and other creatures you'd rather never meet. Those invertebrates that ruled the planet looked so weird and not Earth-like that it took scientists years to realize these scary creatures were actually the ancestors of modern mollusks and crustaceans. Meet Hallucigenia, a creature with seven or eight pairs of spindly legs, the same number of paired spikes coming from its back and a head you won't tell from its tail. Another cool creature from that period was the abnormal shrimp. Unlike most animals back then that were tiny, it was over three feet from head to tail. There was also the Wewaxia, that looked sort of like a stegosaurus, but without a head, a tail, or any legs. It looks like these creatures were born without defensive spikes and grew them as they got older. If they ran a beauty contest in the Cambrian period, Aishia would likely win. It had many common features with today's tardigrades, although it was just one or two inches long. It was the nightmare of prehistoric sponges, and it clung to them with its multiple claws. We still have some live souvenirs from the Ordovician period living among us. Take lampreys, for example. The marine life kept flourishing. There were squid-like nautiloids with tentacles and a special shell with gas-filled chambers that made them float in the water. They swam well by squirting water out of their bodies and used their tentacles to catch prey. Another group of sea hunters was the conodonts with their tiny fossil teeth. The few complete fossils we have found show that they looked like eels with big eyes to spot their food. Fish back then were small, with mouths that pointed downward, which helped them suck up food from the ocean floor. Lampreys and hagfish are their living relatives today. The hard-bodied anthropods, like early relatives of crabs and spiders, started exploring life on land. They moved into freshwater and shallow lagoons, and one type of these creatures was the horseshoe crab. Even though they're called crabs, they're actually more like spiders and scorpions. Around this time, the first simple plants also began to grow on land. But a surprise ice age interrupted their plans. Most of the world's land at that time came together to make a huge supercontinent called Gondwana. It included what is now Africa, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. Another supercontinent, called Laurentia, included what would become North America. Gondwana drifted south until it settled at the North Pole. Huge glaciers started forming over what is now Africa. This led to a 20 million year ice age and a huge extinction. At least half of all marine species were wiped out around 443 million years ago. The landscape wasn't looking too cozy, but have no worries, the first plants were about to hit the land. As temperatures rose and sea levels climbed again, the oceans began to recover during the Silurian period. Huge reef systems grew in the warm, clear tropical seas. You can still see remnants of these ancient reefs today. They are limestone rocks. The oceans were full of tiny creatures called plankton. At the top of the food chain were these terrifying sea scorpions. Some of these sea scorpions grew to over six feet long, and they were the largest anthropods ever. They looked like giant scorpions with huge, compound eyes to spot their prey, the primitive fish. They caught it with their strong, claw-like pinchers. Speaking of fish, they were starting to change and found new ways to eat not just by sucking up food from the ocean floor. A group of spiny sharks developed jaws, which made their mouths more dangerous. Even though these jawed fish weren't very big during this time, they were becoming better hunters and would later become top predators. On land, the first tiny creepy crawlies began to show up. They were primitive centipedes and early ancestors of spiders. 
The first plants on land didn't have leaves, but they could stand up straight, thanks to their stiff stems. They also had special tubes inside them to move water and nutrients around, just like how our veins move blood. Mosses and other small plants soon followed and helped create a better environment for animals to start living on land too. The climate was nice and warm. The supercontinent Gondwana was still near the South Pole, but the big ice sheets from before melted away. Plants continued to grow and change during the Devonian period, but you'd probably be more impressed by a millipede as long as a car. If you visited the Earth back then, you'd wander in the first big forests made up of lycophytes, horsetails, and ferns. By the end of this period, the first successful trees appeared. They could grow really tall, up to 98 feet, about half as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and had thick trunks, about 3 feet wide. They didn't have real leaves but had fern-like parts growing right on their branches and used spores to reproduce. The insects of that time were pretty wild. One of them was a huge dragonfly with wings as wide as a big pizza. This giant dragonfly lived in open places where it had room to fly, and its big eyes helped it spot its food. Smaller bugs. It used its spiky legs to grab the insects it wanted to eat. Another monster from that time had wings about 22 inches wide and a mouth that looked like a beak. On the ground, the biggest bug ever known on Earth was wandering wild and free. It was a millipede as long as a car that likely ate fruits and seeds. The insect grew into such giants thanks to the extra oxygen in the air, up to 35% instead of the usual 21%. They could easily breathe even when they were huge, and there were no big birds to eat them, so they could grow really big and explore land and sky with nothing to worry about. But not for long. Fish started changing into the first animals that could live on land. These early fish had special fins that worked like arms and legs, and they could explore new, swampy areas where there were lots of plants and no big predators. One of the oldest animals that show this change mostly lived in shallow water, where it walked on the bottom. It had a head that looked like a crocodile's, and it could move its neck and breathe air through its nostrils. It grew up to 10 feet long. Its back fins were bigger and stronger than the front ones, which helped it move on land. At the end of the Devonian period, Earth went through two long extinction periods when up to 70% of sea creatures disappeared. But the plants and animals living on land mostly survived these tough, cold times. It also had a cool, distant cousin, coelacanth. This fish was almost 5 feet long and had 4 fins that looked like limbs, but it never moved to land. It adapted to life in deep water, hiding in caves during the day and hunting at night. This deep-sea lifestyle probably helped coelacanth survive four of Earth's major mass extinctions. For a long time, people thought it was extinct until one was found off the coast of South Africa in 1938. So yep, it still lives in the deep parts of the Indian Ocean. During the late Paleozoic era, animals including a crazy mix of a polar bear and a saber-toothed cat got all independent and didn't have to live near the water anymore. They started laying eggs on land. Fish were becoming more different from each other, and trilobites were starting to disappear. New plants called conifers were growing and two new types of animals also appeared. There were marine reptiles, like early lizards and snakes and archosaurs, which later turned into crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. This period is sometimes called the Age of the Cockroaches, because an early kind of cockroach was lurking all over the world. But there was something way cooler than a cockroach, like a mix of a polar bear and a saber-toothed cat. It was an early relative of today's mammals with long legs that helped it run fast. 
It had sharp, saber-like teeth that could slice through the necks of huge plant-eating animals. But it used its teeth to rip big chunks of meat rather than chew. Scientists aren't sure if it had scales like its older relatives or fur like its mammal cousins. But they found hints of ancient poop that smaller relatives had hair, so this guy probably did too. There was also a big reptile that lived in the cold deserts of Eurasia. Imagine a creature as big and heavy as a black rhino, weighing about 2,400 pounds and stretching around 10 feet from head to tail. It was covered in thick, bumpy plates all over its body, which helped protect it from predators. Because it was so heavy and slow, it couldn't run fast, so these tough plates were its best defense. To stay so big and strong, Scutosaurus had to eat a lot of food all the time. It was one of the first big plant-eating animals to live on Earth. These animals were like early versions of big dinosaurs that came later. Even though Scutosaurus looked a lot like those dinosaurs, it was not closely related to them, kind of like how we're not closely related to whales and dolphins. The closest living relative to Scutosaurus is the tortoise, another slow-moving armored reptile. When you look at this guy, Dimetrodon, the first thing you notice is the big sail on its back that could remind you of some dinosaurs, but it was actually more closely related to us. It was a proto-mammal and had some unique features, especially in its skull. It had a small hole behind its eyes where jaw muscles attached, which is something dinosaurs didn't have. Dimetrodon also had different types of teeth for different uses unlike dinosaurs that had rows of the same kind of teeth. The sail on its back was probably used to show off and attract mates, or scare away rivals. The last period of the Paleozoic, called the Permian, ended with the largest mass extinction on Earth ever. It wiped out more than 90% of all the species on the planet. The two big landmasses named Euramerica and Gondwana joined together to form one huge supercontinent called Pangaea. Around Pangaea was a giant ocean. Because Pangaea was so big, the middle of it was probably very dry, since rain clouds couldn't travel far enough to bring water to the interior. This made Pangaea's center a very dry place. The Permian extinction left room for new creatures to thrive. One of them was this guy looking like a real-life Nessie from Scotland. It was a 20-foot-long reptile with a super long neck, even longer than its body and tail combined. And nope, it wasn't a dino yet, but a protosaurus that lived during the Middle Triassic period, which was just before the time of the first dinosaurs. Scientists used to think it was too heavy on top to walk on land because of its long neck, but newer studies show that most of its weight was centered around its body, so it could walk just fine. Between 240 million and 230 million years ago, a new successful group of animals started to rule the world. They managed to evolve from mostly dog and horse-sized creatures into the biggest monsters that ever existed on Earth. Scientists say they managed to do it thanks to some massive volcanic events. But it's a topic for another video. Life during and after the dinosaurs. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.